Thank you for joining today. I'd like to begin by reading from Luke chapter 23 today, a text that is familiar to us, one of the most poignant scenes, I think, from the cross, which may not be a, an appropriate way of phrasing. It seems like every scene from the cross is more poignant than the, the one before. But uh, this one certainly tugs at our heartstrings as much as any other, I think. In Luke 23, starting in verse number 39, uh, this is Jesus on the cross, of course. One of the criminals who was hanged there, uh, one of the criminals who were hanged there, was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Now I want to talk about what that passage means for us here, but before we do that, I want to touch on at least briefly some of the things that this passage is not talking about. But this passage is not a baptism passage. There are a lot of really great baptism passages out there. This is not one of them, and it's easy enough to prove. You can read the passage through again any number of times you like. I don't care what version you're reading from. I challenge you to find the word baptism in there a single time. And I find it remarkable that this passage comes up so consistently when discussing the topic of baptism, particularly the topic of baptism for remission of sins in the presence of people who do not believe in baptism for remission of sins. Well, what about the thief on the cross? The thief on the cross wasn't baptized, and therefore I don't have to be baptized. If you want to have a discussion about baptism, that's great. And in fact, if you personally want to have a discussion about baptism, by all means, reach out to me. I love talking about baptism. But I won't take you to this passage. This isn't a baptism passage. I'll take you to Acts 2.38 or Romans 6.4 or 1 Peter 3.21 or Acts 22.16 or any number of other passages that talk a lot about baptism and what baptism means for us and why we do it and what purpose it serves and how it's accomplished and that sort of thing. Not this passage. Now, of course, the, the one on the other side of this hypothetical argument would say that's exactly my point. Here's a person who is clearly saved, someone who Jesus essentially speaks into heaven, and he wasn't baptized. And, and my response to that, well, I have a lot of responses to that, but the one on my mind particularly today is that that is a backward way of studying the Bible. You don't turn to a passage that doesn't talk about a subject so you have a discussion about the subject. Just like I wouldn't turn to Acts 2.38 to have a discussion about faith. It might come up in conversation, just like this passage might come up in conversation regarding baptism. But if I want to talk about salvation by faith, I'm not going to turn to Acts 2.38 and find an absence of faith in that passage. If you don't believe me, go back and read it yourself. Well, if faith isn't involved in the 3,000 people being baptized on the uh, on the day of Pentecost, well, I guess I don't have to believe either because faith isn't in that passage. No, that's not the point. The point is that passage is encouraging sinful people to repent and then respond to their repentance, which, by the way, was done through baptism, among other things. And any number of other uh, points that we can make there, but again, this is not that sermon. I don't want to preach that sermon. If you want to have a baptism discussion, go to a baptism passage. I'd be glad to go with you there. Nor is this passage a heaven passage. And the topic of heaven and the nature of heaven and the afterlife in general is a very interesting and intriguing concept, obviously. We are caught up with this, and should be, rightfully so, because this is talking about eternity, probably the most basic motivation for us to serve God. We want to go to heaven when we die. And this passage oftentimes is used to describe what it is like. When we go to heaven, especially by people who believe there is a waiting place, a, um, a Hadean realm, sometimes it is called, although that's a Greek concept, not a Hebrew concept, that what happens after we die but before judgment, judgment hasn't happened yet, and we have no longer, we're no longer living in the flesh, so what happens to us? Well, there must be some kind of waiting area, and people go to Luke 16 also and talk about Abraham's bosom, sometimes it's called that, or paradise, if you're reading from Luke 23, and have a uh, conversation about this, this waiting, you know, God's waiting room, basically. And I, I want to emphasize here, 
and again, this is not that sermon either. How God manage how God manages the afterlife is God's business. If we know anything about the afterlife, it is that we do not know and cannot know everything about the afterlife. It is worth pointing out that we are prisoners of time in this life. We cannot conceive, really, in any full sense of the word, living outside of time. And we are being translated into a realm that is not characterized by time at all, except when and where God chooses to characterize it by time. And so it should stand to reason that there are going to be some logical disconnects. Now, if you're a person of faith, you can accept that. You can embrace that. You can roll with that and be content with the idea. If God puts me in a waiting room for a thousand years, if God wants me to put me in Abraham's bosom, if I go straight to, to heaven afterward, either way, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to content, be content. I'm not going to worry about it one way or the other. God's got this. I don't have to have this. I, that is the the way I leave virtually every conversation on this subject these days, because I have learned to avoid talking about things I don't know anything about. And there is very little that I know about heavenly realms, partly because I'm not the greatest Bible student in the world, but mostly, I think, from what I have studied, because the Bible just doesn't talk about heavenly realms all that much, and not with a great deal of detail, because I think we probably couldn't handle the detail. That's my own personal wisdom on the subject. You can take that for what it's worth. So if you want some kind of snapshot of what the afterlife is like, realize in your searches for passages such as that, that is not why we have this passage. That's not why we have this conversation recorded for us. This is not a heaven conversation any more than it is a baptism conversation. What it is, is a faith conversation, first of all. This is a faith story, ultimately, a testimony to the power of belief and especially belief in remarkable and unusual and, in fact, extremely surprising circumstances. How could it be that of all places, out of all times, the greatest affirmation of the spiritual nature of Jesus' kingdom comes at the cross by someone who, as far as we know, doesn't know Jesus from a hole in the wall? Now, I say as far as we know, clearly the implications of the text are that the thief knows something about Jesus. He knows about the kingdom and is willing to accept Jesus as king. But if it was truly the case, as everyone else around seems to have thought, that Jesus had anticipated an earthly kingdom, a physical kingdom, with he himself on the throne, why is the thief's faith so strong in this moment when it seems that defeat is not only inevitable, but virtually accomplished already. How could Jesus possibly be king when he's in the process of dying? And yet, somehow, and the Bible doesn't address this, and so I'm not going to either, somehow the thief comes to understand that Jesus' kingdom is still real, that the cross is not going to stand in the way of Jesus accomplishing these things. This is the epitome, I think, of the substance that is hoped for, the conviction of things that is not seen. That's what faith is all about. The thief does not see and will never see in the flesh the fullness of Jesus' kingdom. He has to know that. And yet he believes anyway. He knew that whatever the cross was, however powerful it may have been, however important it may have been, it was not going to stand in the way of the success of the kingdom. That's what Jesus asks us to do as we engage in our faith journey, as we sit on our own crosses, as it were. What Jesus wants us to do is acknowledge his rule, acknowledge that he is king, own him as king of kings and lord of lords, and beg him for mercy, like the publican did in the parable in Luke chapter 18, verse 13. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. That's not all we have to do, obviously, touching briefly on the, the usual thief on the cross conversation that I have. But, uh, but it is critical wherever we happen to be in our journey of faith, that we realize that Jesus is Lord and he's always Lord. It may seem in the moment, especially when we ourselves are suffering, that Jesus is not Lord, that Jesus has, has lost a grip, that he is asleep at the switch, whatever figure of speech you want to use here. When, and the problem is, it's very easy for us to confuse getting Jesus' way with getting our own way. 
when things go wrong for us personally, we assume that the kingdom is off kilter, that Jesus has, has forgotten about us or forgotten about all of us. And that's not the case. It's certainly not necessarily the case. I would argue that it's much more of a comment on our own personal faith, our own personal journey that doesn't always go very well. Paul refers to a co-worker of his named Demas who had forsaken him, having loved this present world, he says in 2 Timothy 4 verse 10. What exactly does that mean? Paul doesn't tell us. But what it seems like is that the hardships, the difficulties, the opposition, the, the punishment, the pain, the potential death that Paul faced all the time that obviously worked against his own personal interests in this life started to weigh on Demas. And because he had too much concern for this present world, he decided that the life Paul was living was not appropriate for him. That may be doing Demas a disservice, but that seems like the obvious application of what he has to say there, especially in the context of things going wrong for Paul and so many of his companions deserting him, sometimes for noble reasons and lots of times for reasons that are not noble at all. We need to have confidence that he is working things out for us, especially when things seem to be going wrong, when his plan does not seem to reflect our plan. And I like to think that when I put it in terms like that, it, it kind of sets my, kind of resets me a little bit. I, I get reoriented, as it were, uh, re, reconfigured. Because is there any reason for me to expect that Jesus' plan and my plan are going to be exactly the same? I can't see any reason why that would be the case any more than my plan and your plan are going to be exactly the same. Well, if they're not exactly the same, why should I be surprised when they're not the same? And when they are not the same, shouldn't I naturally, as a child of God, defer to Jesus' plan instead of my plan, which I consistently over and over again say is not as important as Jesus' plan? In uh, verse number 39 of our context here, the, the other thief, and I think he's probably being sarcastic or ironic or, or hurtful. It's, it's kind of weird how people in pain try to cause other people to be in pain. But he's, he's shouting out, if you're really the son of God, save yourself and us. Uh, that seems much more of a mockery thing than an actual cry for help. But regardless of that thief's particular attitude, I think we can all relate a little bit. That it stands to reason in the moment, especially in the moment of pain, that the best thing for Jesus to do is to elevate us, to defeat our enemies, to lift us up, to glorify us, to show that we made a good choice instead of a poor choice or a silly choice. And that way, surely everybody would see us and they would be moved to glorify God, like Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, verse 12. And it doesn't work out that way sometimes. And maybe we understand or maybe we don't understand. Ultimately, it's the way it is. And all of us will encounter that. At some point, if you're not encountering that yet, you just haven't been paying attention or maybe you haven't been standing for the truth. When Jesus plan doesn't seem to be going according to our plan, that's the time for us to build our faith, not to lose our faith. The thief on the cross was able to build his faith and we need to be able to do the same thing ourselves. Now, the story of the thief on the cross is also a repentance story because we see a, a transition taking place, to a certain degree at least. Uh, most of the scholars uh, agree with my take on this. Matthew chapter 27, verse 44, tells a very different story with regard to the th two thieves on the cross. The, the plurality is used there. The thieves themselves were mocking Jesus. And that very well could be that the, mocker that the mockery that we read about in Luke's account is attributed to the thieves in general. His company, you know, the company on the cross, as it were, that was coming from them in a general sort of sense. It was actually only, it was only worded by the one man, but he assumed he was speaking for the both of them, at least in the moment he thought he was speaking for the both of them. That very well could be the case. A somewhat easier explanation might be that they were both mocking Jesus for a while. And then ultimately, there were pangs of conscience with regard to the thief, the one that we usually talk about, the, the penitent thief. He realized, and maybe realized the entire time, that his activity was wrong, that he was taking a stand with that which was evil, that which was blasphemous, in fact, and that he could and needed to do better. 
And we talk about deathbed repentance sometimes, and, and the thief on the cross is a great example of that. Here's someone, whether it was in the moment of the cross or not, someone who was living a life that was violent, that was rebellious, that took no thought for, for civil authority, no thought for, for in, you know, other people's preferences and such. The thieves that we talk about, when we think thieves, we think of people who steal purses and stuff like that. The thieves on the cross were insurrectionists, rebels. Uh, one version in one place uh, calls uh, Barabbas a murderer, for instance. Uh, someone who was uh, a robber is the same word there. But this class of individuals, these rebels that date all the way back to Jeremiah's day and really all the way back to Ehud's day, there has always been in times of trouble, in times of oppression among the Israelite people, this class of individuals, sometimes they're called the Sakari, the knife, uh, the knife wielders, who are what we would call today terrorists, people who are taking the law into their own hands, sometimes uh, with the approval of God like Ehud, sometimes not necessarily with the approval of God like Ishmael in the days of Jeremiah, who killed the appointed leader of the Jews from the Babylonians after the destruction of Jerusalem. These people want to take rule into their own hands so that they can accomplish their vision of the kingdom, their vision of Jewish rule in society. And generally speaking, they meet the same end that these two thieves meet, the same end that Barabbas was going to meet had he not run across Jesus of Nazareth on this particular day. In Acts chapter 5, Gamaliel refers to one named Judas and another named Theodos, who appear to be in the same kind of category. They both came to nothing as well. Rome was pretty effective historically speaking, dealing with this, with these kind of people. And so it's no surprise they wind up on the cross. All that to say, these are bad people. These are people who deserve to be crucified by any conventional measure of, of righteousness, of, of decent government behavior. But these people can be forgiven too. And that needs to be at the forefront of our memory when we try to rate sins, when we try to qualify people as being really bad sinners or maybe not quite so bad sinners, that sort of thing. No matter how awful your behavior, no matter how awful your value system, there is always a way to find your way home. Blasphemy against the, the Son of Man can be and will be forgiven. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 32, uh, you can't take that same kind of dismissive attitude toward the gospel. There's no gospel coming after this. But 3,000 people who at least passively, and many of them even actively, no doubt were supporting, even promoting, the idea of sending Jesus to the cross just seven weeks prior to this, all of a sudden now realize that they were in the wrong. They are guilty of killing their own deity, their own Messiah. And they cry out in Acts 2, verse 37, we referred to the passage earlier, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were wrong. They needed to repent, and Peter tells them to repent because they can repent. That is an opportunity for any sinner. Anyone is capable of turning to God in these moments. And what a blessing it is to know that he hears those prayers, that he listens to these fallen ones, regardless of the, the volume or the intensity or the length of your sin. He is willing to have these prodigals come home. And it's maybe worth touching on briefly that we do not share that same kind of forgiving spirit. At least uh, we, we don't always, and I, I fear that we never really share it as fully as God shares it with us. When we see things going wrong, we see people doing us wrong. We are rooting for their downfall and promoting their downfall oftentimes, sometimes outside the law, sometimes within the law, whatever. But it's always a, an opportunity for joy, for excitement, for thrill. It's, it's vicarious satisfaction when other people suffer, when they've been punishing us. And we're all in favor of God's justice, of course. But we need to realize that souls in danger always deserve our pity. They always deserve our patience, our willingness to forgive, this forgiving spirit that Jesus himself shows on the cross. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Paul, speaking of his enemy, Alexander, in 2 Timothy 4, verse 14, emphasizes that God is going to repay to him and uh, accommodatively to, to everyone else who rebels, repay to them according to their deeds. God will take care of that. 
We don't have to worry about revenge. We don't have to worry about making sure the scales are evened out at some point. God is in charge of that. He may not appear to be in charge of that in the moment. He may not be accomplishing his justice as quickly or as completely or as visibly as you and I might like in the moment. That doesn't mean it's not happening. Again, go back to the faith point. We believe that God is watching over us. And that frees us up to be forgiving people, patient people, joyful people. It frees us up to love our enemies, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, to have confidence that these ones deserve our mercy, at least as much as we deserve God's mercy. We can be patient with them. We can pray for them. We can intercede on God uh, to God on their behalf because we are also, as God uh, as Peter says of Jesus and God in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, we are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is our desire, or should be at least, as much as it is God's desire. Uh, one other point uh, before we close up. This is maybe even more than anything else. This is a grace story. This is a story of how fallen human beings can be embraced by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what grace is. Grace is finding favor at God's hand when we did not deserve it. You know, I've been saying this is a this is a grace story, this is a repentance story, this is a faith story, or whatever. At its core, every story, not only every story in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every story in the Bible, when you dig hard enough, when you dig deep enough, is a Jesus story. It's all about God's relationships with his people, with his creation making them, giving them purpose, guiding them along the way, dealing with their rebellion, sorting things out at the end. This is always what God has done with his people. Every story in the Bible is about this. And if every story is about God's dealings with his people, then ultimately every story is going to be about Jesus because that's how God deals with his people, how he has always planned to deal with his people. Long before Jesus was ever born in Bethlehem, long after he died on Calvary's cross, this has been the story of God's dealings with mankind. And it is noteworthy that Jesus takes time here to have a conversation, a brief conversation at least, but a conversation nevertheless with this man who it seems at least was a horrible human being and doing horrible, saying horrible things even on the cross, even in the midst of death just a few moments earlier. And even if you want to put the best spin possible on this fellow, that he was a patriot, he loved his nation, he uh, was had good intentions, all the rest of it. No matter how positive a picture you paint for the thief on the cross or any other human being, as far as that goes, we are all sinners. None of us deserves grace. That's, that's the nature of grace. We get grace because we don't deserve grace. Paul writes of himself in uh, second, uh, first Timothy, rather, uh, chapter 1 and verse number 12, the passage that you're probably quite familiar with. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, maybe touching just for a moment on the word invisible there that kind of jumped out at me as I just read that. Going back to the idea of, of faith, Going back to the idea of trusting in God for all of these things. God's grace is invisible. We don't always see how it is that Jesus is forgiving us, that how Jesus is elevating us. It, at various points in Paul's life, I'm sure it looked very much like Jesus was dragging Paul through the mud. Maybe even literally. But Paul was able to maintain faith because he believed that Jesus was in fact Lord. That he does in fact reign uh, on the throne of heaven, as King of kings and Lord of lords. And that as that king, as that, that leader, he still had time for Paul. He still has time for the thief. He still has time for you and for me.
What a wonderful thing that is, that in that moment, Jesus reaches out to the, the ugliest of sinners, and it makes us question what we do when we are suffering hardship. Are you spending time in your difficult days fretting about other people, concerned about other people's sufferings? If I'm going through this, imagine what so-and-so is going through, and finding a, enough energy in your heart in those moments to pity others, to pray for others. Or are we just so caught up in our own circumstances we can't pray about anything except ourselves? Pray for ourselves, by all means, no matter what your circumstances, good, bad, worst day ever, anywhere in between. Pray for your own circumstances, absolutely. But there's always time for grace. There is always time for reaching out to other people and elevating other people and praying for their welfare and their well-being, especially their spiritual well-being. I can't help thinking that this was, maybe it's a little bit strong to say, a, a source of, of positivity, a, a source of, of pleasure for Jesus on the cross. But Hebrews chapter 12, verse, four, uh, verse 2, rather, talks about the joy that was set before him and why Jesus was able to go to the cross, enduring the shame, because of the joy set before him. Maybe this is a bit of a foretaste of that joy. He sees even on the cross a sinner reaching out for grace, a sinner reaching out for his Savior, even when it seemed for all the world that the Savior was completely incapable of rendering any aid whatsoever to himself, let alone anybody else. The thief had faith. The thief was able to repent. And therefore, Jesus was able to extend grace to this one soul here in his lowest of moments. Maybe it's simpler than that. Maybe it's a source of joy for Jesus to simply realize that he wasn't alone in this moment, that there was another spiritual warrior there on another cross who was also trying to accomplish spiritual things in his own life, maybe even in the lives of others. Someone who acknowledged the nature of the kingdom, what Jesus was trying to accomplish, which no one else seems to have, have grasped, no matter how much Jesus beat him over the head with the concept going from Pilate to Peter to whoever else you might want to talk about. It should give us that same kind of satisfaction, that same kind of joy in our suffering when we are bearing our own cross. And Jesus promises that He's going, that we're going to bear our own cross. That's, that's the whole thing. That's what being a Christian is all about, bearing our cross. And that may not seem like the most pleasant of experiences. And oftentimes it's not, at least in the short term. But when we look across the way and we find somebody else bearing his cross, and we find someone else doing it with dignity and with grace and with humility and with hope, with the, the obvious faith that the path that they have chosen, the same path that we have chosen, was the right path. That's got to give us a little bit of a boost when we see someone else doing what we say we are doing. It's no longer I live that live, but Christ lives in me, Galatians 2 verse 20 says. Well, if Jesus went to the cross, it stands to reason I'm going to go to the cross too. And that's fine as long as I'm not on the cross. And when I find myself on the cross, when I find myself suffering, I find myself being treated with indignity and even violence. That is a disconcerting thing. That's something that is difficult to deal with. No question about that. And it should give us considerable joy and peace and comfort to know that not only is not only are we not alone on the cross, Jesus is here with us, but also we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are with us. We have people who are going through the same thing that we're going through, or worse even. And they appear, at least, I'm sure they're wrestling their own demons as we are as well, but they seem to be putting a good foot forward. They seem to be maintaining their hope, their confidence. Maybe I can too. Maybe I can find strength when I am crucified with Jesus to know that there is fellowship here. There is hope here. There is peace here. There is love and joy here. Not only through Jesus and his interaction with us, although that ought to be enough. It is enough. But also even beyond that, through the fellowship that we have with brothers and sisters in Christ. Such ones, these ones who walk with Jesus, these ones who are crucified, these ones who've been baptized into his body, have had their sins washed away, these ones are going to be with Jesus and with all the saved of humanity throughout all the ages. 
in God's paradise, whatever that looks like, however much it does or does not look like the things that we read about in Revelation, for instance, or other passages we could turn to, is the, the least relevant thing in the world. The important thing is what Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where we're going to be caught up together to be with the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. The thief on the cross is going to be there. You and I are going to be there if we're found faithful. So let's make sure that we're found faithful so that we can be in the paradise of God when the time comes for God to accomplish these things in our lives and the lives of others. I hope and pray that this has been a blessing to you, that you can continue to read and study this passage and other passages, uh, touching on the subjects that we've discussed here and, and maybe even related subjects that we briefly discussed on and maybe returning to at some other time. In any case, thank you very much for listening and following along. Hope and pray this is a blessing to you. And God bless.